Welcome to You Don't Know Ball. Today, we're going to be overreacting to week two of the NFL. If you don't know ball and want to know ball, be sure to subscribe. Leave a like. Let us know in the comments your biggest overreaction from week two. Dobbs, tell me if I'm overreacting. Caleb Williams a bust. He's a bust. After two weeks, Caleb Williams is a bust. Through two games, he's 37 of 36. 56.1 completion percentage. 267 yards, four yards per attempt, which is last in the league. Zero touchdowns, two interceptions, minus negative 34.2 EPA per play, which is bottom three in the league, just in front of Bryce Young and Bo Nix, bottom five in completion percentage over expected, bottom three in QB rating, one of four QBs without touchdowns through two games, lowest yards per attempt in the league. I said that earlier. Eighth, this is a positive. It's the eighth lowest time to throw in the league. But you could look at that as they're just throwing screen passes. Or he's just dunking the ball off. He's not taking shots. Pressured on 43.2% of his dropbacks so far through two weeks. Is Caleb Williams a bust? He's a bust, or am I overreacting? I'm going to tell you this, Hunter. You're overreacting that Caleb Williams is a bust. But with that being said, I, I, let me be clear. I still have so, I still have plenty of faith in Caleb, but what I don't have faith in is anything that the Bears have going for Caleb this season, and there will need to be drastic changes to the operation after this year. So let's just start with the obvious here, Hunter. Now, and number one, and I'm hand up guy. I'm always going to say when I was wrong, and I always like to get ahead of it. Like I always say, Shane Waldron was actually. Funny enough, probably the worst imaginable hire that you guys could have made at this point, right? And, and and here's why. The Bears needed to go West Coast, motion heavy. That's what that's what they needed to do. Not and that's not even just a Bears thing. We're seeing from the perspective now of the way that the modern NFL is evolving. Essentially, if you're not running some variation of the West Coast offense, you've just you have fallen behind. And if you and if and if you're not okay admitting that, that's fine, but that's the reality of the NFL nowadays. Everyone who's running a West Coast variation is running an incredibly successful offense for the most part, and people that aren't are falling behind the times. If you're not running motion consistently, if you don't have linebackers eyes moving, it's first of all, it's incredibly hard to run the ball. So I think that's where I want to start. Let's start with the fact that, right, for, for Caleb to have any chance to succeed this year, you have to have teams that have any, that just even a smidgen of fear when you want to run the ball. The Bears run game is vanilla garbage. I mean, realistically, Hunter, me and you know exactly what plays coming 80% of the time, however the Bears line up, because it's just very obvious. They run to the side that the tight end, they run to the strong side 80% of the time. Uh, again, back to there's zero motion. Um, it, the screen game doesn't like the screen game doesn't reflect the run game in any way. It just it the screens are just kind of thrown in like willy nilly. There's it, there's no tie in to the run to, to the run game. To so bad. Dude. It is so the linebackers. Bad. And and let's get and let's that, that's just from scratching the surface. Let's get to part two where it's bad enough to have a run game that isn't functional from a schematic standpoint. Now, it's even worse when the run game doesn't work from a schematic st standpoint and your offensive line is arguably the worst in the league. And I know that, yeah, if you're looking at okay. just PFF or grading right. right now, you're saying to yourself, eh, it's not that bad. No, trust me, it's really that bad. Because the problem is this too, Hunter. Let's just call for what it is. Braxton Jones was actually a very solid swing tackle and, and or starter even just two years ago. Last year was shaky. This year, Braxton Jones is really, really bad. On the other side, Darnell Wright had a really solid work year. I'm not even going to say good. Solid in terms of like, yeah, I see the downside, but man, oh man, is he a ginormous human being, and I think that he'll figure it out. But this year, Darnell Wright looks absolutely atrocious. He bad in camp, dude. It, it bad. It's bad. And Nate Davis is probably the worst guard in the whole league. It's very, I mean, Nate Davis was an atrocious signing. Call that one for what it was off the bat. Uh, and the funniest part is this. This is where it gets really funny to me. Uh, and, and look, Tevin Jenkins is awesome when he's out there, actually. that's I'll give you credit. Tevin Jenkins is the one alignment when he's out there. He's actually he's playing good ball. He's not that good, bro. He's but but he's not. Well, good. he's he's also not even out there. Really, we, can we rely on him to be out there more than half the season this year, knowing the history yeah. of just, just of Tevin that's Jenkins? Fair. That's a problem. And then that's the funniest part. You know, the one guy that we thought was going to be the uh, like the the abomination of the line that was going to be the one to ruin the operation, Coleman Shelton. Funny enough, yeah, he's actually playing the best ball in this entire line. I mean, the, the reality is, Hunter, I, the reality is it's there's so many he, problems. He's so bad, though. Like, he gets blown up so often. No, he, he, look, look, he does. But that's the thing is, he's, for what it's worth, 
him and Tevin Jenkins are the only guys even playing worth the damn. And that's the scary part is, is everyone else is so much worse that somehow Coleman Shelton is the guy that's the highest graded and is doing the most work on this O-line. And, and look, that just scratched the surface again. You know, you spent the first round pick on Romo Dunze. God bless him. But I've been saying from the whole draft process, look, he was not the right pick because it doesn't matter if they, if, if even if, uh, Marv was available that pick. It doesn't matter because the weapon was not the weapon was not the direction this team needed to go. When you have a young quarterback and you need to keep their confidence upright and they're coming from a situation where they were the star and the and, and yes, as we've acknowledged, Caleb Williams O line was not good in, in college. It really wasn't. But when you're playing against college athletes, you can mitigate it a lot more, right? These dudes are not running at you 20 miles an hour every single snap off the edge. It, it's different now. Caleb is not gonna have the same escapability he had. And yes, we've seen he still has the escapability, but it's not gonna be the same. And it never will be that's not how the nfl works it, it just isn't it, you need an o-line that functions it's the fact of the matter for every single nfl team the bears don't have a functioning o-line they spent a premium premium ninth overall pick on a weapon that they didn't need i mean look i'm gonna let you go from here because i could go further but i want to hear your thoughts as well here hunter so this is let's just be clear i don't think caleb williams is a bust i was just setting up the conversation like let's be no yeah that, I, I was gonna say I, I, you, you know great yeah, minds think alike. Yeah, we knew you I, had to set it up you know we had to set up with a punch i think i'm just saying like along the lines of what is so frustrating to me dobbs is we spent you know you are a saints fan we spent most of the off season talking about how the saints are probably gonna have the worst o line in the league they're graded as one of the best and the craziest part about it is the offensive coordinator that the saints hired the bears interviewed twice they could have had what the Saints have right now, and they didn't. And it just feels like, and we talked about this a little bit before the show, um, you being from the Chicagoland area, you know, me being a Bears fan, like, we have watched this team over the years, and it always seems like when everybody's going right, for whatever reason, good or bad, they go left. It's like, why not do the Shanahan tree? Why not? do the McVay tree. Why not go that way? Everyone is going that way because it works. And it's like, you bring in Waldron, who, dude, the, here's my thing. I, we have watched, if, if for as bad as the Bears have been on offense, we can have always have relied on the run game the last couple of years, whether that's Justin, whether that's our running backs, whether that's our run uh, blocking for the uh, O-line. O Whenever the Bears ran the ball last night, it was honestly a waste of a down. I don't care if the Texans literally played pass defense every time. We had a better chance of gaining a couple yards throwing the ball than we ever did running. DeAndre Swift, I'm convinced, could put on a blindfold and run for more yards per carry than he did last night because that man has some of the worst vision I have ever seen. It is so bad. My issue comes with this, okay? I don't necessarily agree with the trope of... So let's, just to be clear, the point of this is, honestly, Caleb Williams is the least of the Bears' problems right now. It is coaching, and it is the offensive line. I was talking about this earlier today. While... When we watched Fields, and this is not going to be a Fields, Fields versus Caleb point... When I watch Fields compared to what I watched Caleb the last couple of games, what you see in Caleb, you never really saw Fields do on the field. And when we watch Fields, it was always, is it Fields? Is it the O-line? Is it the coaching? These games have been clear that it has not been Caleb. It has been the offensive line. It has been coaching. And it's just the same old story, you know, over the last however many years, Dobbs. It's like mind-numbingly bad. Why? Have we always struggled with offensive line? Why have we always struggled with getting the offensive coach? And I don't agree with the point of, oh, you have to go offensive head coach, right? Because then what if you can't get the defensive coach right and your team has to put up 50 points a game to win a game? Like, I think complementary football is so big. But if you're going to go defensive head coach, you have to have a competent offensive play caller. And I understand why you went with Waldron because you wanted someone with play calling experience after getting burned by the Getsy hire because he hadn't been calling plays. And Clint Kubiak, I think, called plays for a limited time prior, but not, not when he was on the 49ers, obviously. But my thing is, just because you made the wrong choice doesn't mean the opposite direction is the right choice either. Maybe you just picked the wrong guy, and I think that was the case. Like, 
Oh, Nagy didn't work. Let's go to Flus. You know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't it doesn't work like that. And I guess my thing is they are going to really, really hinder Caleb's development if we're in a situation where we have to watch him get killed behind this offensive line. And I'm going to stop. We've been, we literally have both gone on rants here because it's just so despicable. But Nate Davis cannot start another game. He is so out of it. He has no clue what's going on. He's constantly missing blocks. Like there was a, there was a, he got to the second level, and he literally ran between both the defenders. Oh no, that was a, that was an NCAA football twenty five EA Sports moment. Literally, can, that's the type of shit EA Sports codes into their games. Like he cannot start another down for the Chicago Bears. I don't give a fuck about the contract. I don't give a fuck about any of that. He is horrible constantly when he's out there. Horrible signing by Ryan Poles. With that being said, Dobbs, I think it's safe to say that Caleb Williams is not a bust, but the Bears' offensive line and coaching staff really need to get it figured out. And if not, and this, this, this is my last point, okay? Be- besides that, I'll say the Bears' O-line allow the third most pressures of any team in the NFL through two weeks, and they're bottom five in rushing yards per game. That is very bad. We, this offseason, we talked about, okay, if they keep Flus, they can't get this wrong because we've lived in the lame duck head coach, rookie, quarterback too many times. And it's looking like they made a mistake once again after looking at history in the face and saying this has never worked. When has a coach been on the hot seat and saved his job? When has it happened? It's very rare. And then last thing, Hunter, because we will move on for this. I just want to make two more very crucial points. Look, you know, and it pains me to say this because, you know, we've been championing, championing him for so long. But this all does fall on – this falls on Ryan Poles. There's just no other way to say it. Ryan, Poles. Especially because, look, you know, Ryan Poles had a very – and this is from the outside perspective. I know probably Bears fans don't want to look at it this way, but you're going to have to follow me here for a second. I think Ryan Poles has had a very smug – attitude the whole time kind of like oh yeah like you know just keep doubting us like oh we're coming like and we're taking the north you know like the whole you know we're taking all that all that shit right but the problem when you open your mouth with shit like that is you got to back it up because people like me don't like when you open your mouth about shit like that and then you come out looking flat it, to me that's actually it, it, it to me that's like the lowest thing you can do because not only is it setting your fans up for disappointment, but it shows that you had more faith in your operation than the operation had, in, like than operate than you should have. I get, I'm just trying to think of the analogy here, but you get my point. That you had, you had so much confidence in your operation, but the operation isn't showing as that the operation was successful. And, and last thing I want to say because it's it's a different tangent, but and we'll move on. This is this is true too, though. I want to point this out. Yes, it is Caleb's deep ball right now. And pretty, pretty inaccurate. And, and to the point where I'm like, okay, this is not the Caleb I saw in college. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, again, back to the O line, he is Hunter. He's fucking shell shocked back there. Yeah, Every bad. snap he drops back, he's a terrified. He's going to get hit from left or right. It doesn't even matter what side it's coming from. It could be up the middle. He's, he's petrified back there. And I don't blame him when you come from a situation when you could do whatever you want and escape from anybody to a situation when you're literally in a collapsing pocket, basically three fourths of the snaps of your entire career, two games in. Well, I don't blame him for being trigger happy and not putting the ball where it needs to be. He's a rookie and he has no time. Time. And, you know, final point, Hunter, it, it, this draft, all of the assets for the first two rounds, they need to, to go into the O line, whether it's for development depth pieces or for starters. This team cannot continue to rely on hinge, you know, hinge starters in free agency and, and, and depth pieces via draft capital. It is the stupidest, most illogical shit that's the main thing that needs to be addressed this offseason. And it starts It starts with Ryan Poles and the smug fucking attitude that he needs to wipe from his face. And that is a fact. Okay, Dobbs, what are you overreacting to this week? I'm, I'm done. I'm done with the Bears, dude. I've sulked in it. I think Bears fans would agree with everything we just said. Bears fans, I'm sorry. You know, we had to, we had to lay it out, though, because we come from a passionate place. We come okay. from a passionate place. Last thing I promise. Last thing I promise. The fact that we had a chance to win the game with a minute 30 left, guys, remember when we got blown out by the Chiefs 41 to whatever? This, the Bears team as a whole is moving in the right direction. But we need to make some very critical decisions coming up or else we're going to be right back to where we started. Facts. 
All right, what Back am I over? What are you overreacting to, Dobbs? All right, now you, now you tell me, Hunter, because you know I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick on the theme of NFC North here for a little okay. bit. We're gonna we're gonna stick on an NFC North theme here for the first couple. Um, my question to you is: Am I overreacting by saying Jared Goff is going through a really major regression this season? And and uh, I'm I'll let you answer. Or do you want my reasons off the bat? Go ahead, go ahead. Tell me why. Okay, here here's what I'm thinking, Hunter. Look, number one, week one. Right, week one versus the Rams. We have Jared Goff going 18 of 28, 217 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Now, what I, the caveat that I want to add to that is, is that's not necessarily all that alarming off the bat. But it gets really alarming when you consider that uh, just yesterday, the Rams just allowed the Cardinals to score 42 points. And for Kyler Murray to have a perfect passer rating on 17 of 21, 266 yards, and three touchdowns. So let's just start with that by saying that, yeah, uh, you know what? And, and to the point of the, our overreaction last week, yeah, the Rams do look like it's going to be not only an uphill battle, it looks like the Rams might be a bad team this year, call it for what it is. I mean, right, so that's against a team where we're looking at them now like that wasn't even the competition that we thought they were, and that's, a, and that's still a bad game against mid-competition at best currently. And then week two versus the Bucks, 34 of 55, 307 yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions. And I want to add this as well before I move on to my next point. Jared Goff leads the league in attempts right now at 83 at 83 attempts on um, and he has 52 completions. Now we're looking at a completion percentage if we round up to 63. Last year's completion percentage was 67. And that doesn't sound all that bad, but a 4% completion percentage difference is actually a very big difference in the grand scheme of things, especially when you're not throwing anywhere near as many touchdowns and the offensive efficiency is just way lower than it was last year. And what I want to start with next is, this is kind of a little new tangent, but follow me here for a second because everybody's going to understand where I'm going with this. You know, we'll take a look at Jared Goff's career development arc, excluding the rookie year, because again, rookie quarterbacks, it's rookie quarterbacks. But look, Let's move on to Jared Goff's second year in the league. We're looking at a 62% completion percentage, 3,804 yards, 28 touchdowns to seven interceptions. And you're saying like, okay, he really made a jump. Like that's a really big jump. And then we go to the third year and we say, oh, wow. He, Jared Goff basically runner up for MVP, 4,688 yards, 32 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. What a really amazing year from Jared Goff. This team is absolutely on fire. This team it should win the Super Bowl. Right. And we know. And again, we know what happened. But and then we go back over here and then to the to the fourth year. Right. Where you see four thousand six hundred thirty eight yards, twenty two interceptions or twenty two touchdowns. My apologies to 16 interceptions. And we're saying, oh, man, it's a pretty big regression. And then we go to the, you know, the final year here in the L.A. 10 year where we say or we see three thousand nine hundred fifty two yards, 20 touchdowns to 13 interceptions. And 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 to his credit, that final year, 67% uh, completion percentage, right? That was the highest of his tenure in LA, but the, the production just went way down. And you can see, we, you can see year by year, the production and the, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but just the, the feel he had for the offense just kept getting lower and lower. And why I bring that up is because again, we're going to bring, come over to the Detroit arc over here and we're going to see. First year in Detroit, 3,245 yards, 19 touchdowns, interceptions. Now, again, Detroit was a very bare bones team at the time. We didn't expect much, so that's completely understandable and to be expected. All right, and then the next year, that's that that first big jump. 4,438 yards, 29 touchdowns, seven interceptions, right? So, okay, very similar to that LA Rams tenure already. And then the third year is where you're like, oh, Jared Goff, again, right there in that MVP contention, leading the Lions, and you're like, he's their star player. He's the guy. 4,575 yards, 30 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. On 60, again, back to, 70, back to that 67 magic number complete percentage. Well, then, Hunter, we come to this year, and literally exactly on the same timeline as the Rams timeline, this year looks like the year where once, it, it, right, so what, I'm, what am I trying to say? Well, I think what I'm trying to say, Hunter, is is that Jared Goff, once teams get a beat on how to play him and the offense he is in, he makes no adjustments. He is as easy to read as a book. And that's the reality <laughs> of Jared Goff. A and we book. knew this before. We knew this before. We let it. We let Ben Johnson's genius fool us. But now we're right back to square one. Am I crazy for saying this, Hunter? Or is that exactly okay. what we're witnessing so right now? Here, Here is my thing. I think you're overreacting a little bit, right? I think, but not, I don't think, I don't think the proposition is crazy. And this is why I'll tell you that. Jared Goff, right, is a quarterback who 
is going to rely on his mental game over his athleticism to make crazy plays, right? And we know that in the modern league, like, a lot of times that athleticism or natural talent can save quarterbacks from maybe lack of, like, mental game, right? But that's not to say you can't do either. Like, both can coexist and be successful in the league. You just have to be truly elite at one, right? And I think when you look at Jared Goff, and he was with McVay, right? He's been, And he's with Ben Johnson. He's been with two very good play callers, right? I think what they do is they find a part of his game that they can fix. But like you were saying, once defenses start to kind of figure out his his kind of quirks, he becomes much easier to defend. And this is kind of tough because when you look at PFF, right? PFF has them graded in run and pass blocking in the top 15, right? Run block, I think, is top 10. Pass block, I think, is 15. And the um, Detroit Lions have allowed um, the 17th most, uh, the, the 17th highest quarterback pressure percentage in the league, which is, I don't want to, it's just, I don't want to say it's concerning, but it's more just kind of like, this was advertised as the best offensive line in the league and it's new. They, you know, they have new members, like whatever, right? Like it takes time. I get it. And it's not really that big of a cause of concern. My problem comes with the fact that we have seen this. This is, this is a trend. If it happens twice, it's a trend. And I do think that, you know, he does have some down years, but it, it doesn't look good with the Rams especially because of what the Cardinals did to them. And the Cardinals offense is far less inexperienced and their O-line probably doesn't even like begin to compare to the Lions O-line. The Bucks, I picked Detroit to win, but I had a sneaky feeling in my gut that Baker Mayfield was going to go in there and win the game. And... In certain games, Dobbs, would you rather have Baker Mayfield or would you rather have Jared Goff? Because to me, Baker Mayfield is more of a gamer. No, at this point, and look, this let's just this is this is a side tangent, real quick. But you know, uh, for all the Bucks fans out there, you should be you should be doing backflips because this is again everyone. I think at this point, we all know this, but the reality is, Hunter. If the Browns just gave Baker the time he needed and didn't force him to play through injury. Right, the low points of Baker's career have either have all been 100% attributed to lack of experience in the NFL or when he was injured. When Baker was was acclimated playing behind a good old line, Baker looked good in Cleveland, right? Yeah, he uh, did. People love to forget that Baker was very close like very close to leading this team to a AFC Championship appearance in which the Browns had a very good chance of winning and, and even showing up in the Super Bowl, right? So, we're talking like the Browns and this was that's before the Browns were the Browns now, where the where everything else is stacked minus the quarterback position, right? So the reality of the situation is, Hunter, yeah, Baker Mayfield was was completely sold. It's right, just sold down and yeah. and and disregarded, but it was all due to things he couldn't control. And when Baker's in, in a situation where things are under control, he is a top 10 quarterback in the league. And and and, and honestly, arguing that at this point, it's just you're either a Baker hater. <laughs> or, or an Oklahoma hater. I mean, because truthfully, objectively, again, this is from a Saints fan. You're a baiter, right? dude. You're I should have. Baiter. Yeah, you're a baiter. I should have no reason, like, I, to to sit here and be glorified Baker Mayfield. But guess what? I'm an objective football watcher, and I never will be anything else other than that. The reality is that Baker Mayfield's playing fantastic football, and Jared, Jared Goff is playing bad football. Though that's just objectively true at this point. So Jared Goff signed a massive extension this off season. He has a potential out in 2028. Okay, and he is going to eat up, starting in 2026, 23% of the cap, 17 or 18% in 2027, and only 12% next year. So not too bad. With that being said, though, we know that this Lions team, right, is ready to win a Super Bowl now. I have concern for them if they don't win the Super Bowl this year. Because I don't know if Ben Johnson is going to be back next year. And we know we've had this conversation multiple, multiple times. But 
I don't know, dude. Like I, I don't, I, I don't know how it'd be possible for them to run it back with him. You know, like I don't know why he'd stay at this point. No, a a thousand percent, Hunter. And and like, you know, the thing about it is too, like this is a Jerry Goff thing, but right now it's kind of like call it for what it is, right? Right now, the Lions are not playing up to the standard we expected. I mean, Frank Ragnow, massive drop off from last season. And again, you know, I already see the comments, right? You know, we are, me and Hunter are fully aware that we are on a two game sample size and things are subject <laughs> to change. We are fully aware of that. But at, at the, at the very moment, when after it, two it's games, it's just like the reality is like, we have to look at what is presented to us. Well, yeah, you have to look what's presented to us. And I think too many NFL fans live in this fantasy fucking world, Hunter, where, oh, out of nowhere, all these problems are just going to like erase themselves and the coaching staff is going to figure out exactly what they need to do to fix it. And and that's just really not how the NFL works a lot of time. Like, yeah, there's one or two teams every year that'll make a massive turnaround. And, and hopefully for Lions fans, that is the Lions. But you know what, Hunter? I'm not going to sit here and play the game of like, well, what if? No, we're going to play the objective game of witnessing the two weeks of film that we have right now. And with the two weeks of film we have right now, again, back to Frank Ragnow is having a massive regression right now, which is really concerning. Uh, Penai Sewell... He's playing good ball, but he's not playing how he played last year. He's not. As of right now, he's just not. Aiden Hutchinson is far and away the best edge in the league right now. But outside of Aiden Hutchinson, nobody on this defense is stepping up the way that they were going to step up. They're not. I mean, Brian Branch is playing as good as I thought he was going to play. Uh, Ali McNeil not playing as good as I thought he was going to play. Taron Arnold is having a really, really rough time, and that's to be expected. Rookie yeah, corner. Rookie I mean, corner, be, yeah. No, that's to be expected. Matter. But you're starting him, and the volatility that comes with that, you have to eat. Right. And uh, yeah, right, the reality situation is also, I mean— Jameson Williams and I'm Ross A. Brown is awesome. But now there's all this kind of this disconnect where it's almost like Jared Goff doesn't know where to go because he, he, <laughs> he, I don't know how to, you know how to explain it. But now that Jameson's out here too, it's like he doesn't, you know, I'm Ra was just like, ah, fuck it. I'm Ra or Lapore's down there somewhere. Now it's like, he's thinking too much. He's like, he, it's like he has too many weapons. I didn't think like, about that. You know what I mean? I don't even know how to, how to say it other than that. But again, and also for what it's worth, we, you know, call it for what it is, too. And this one hurts to say because he's my guy and he's one of my, uh, you know, fantasy kings unrelated. You know, who gives a shit about fantasy? But Sam Laporta compared Dude, to last year, to, Sam Laporta's playing really bad this year. And it's a fact. You know, I'm sorry. And if and if any Lions fan is hurt about this or you want to be unobjective, I, I don't give a shit. Everything I just said is verifiably true. If you're watching the tape, it's all, you're going to understand exactly what I'm saying. The bottom line is this, Hunter. The Lions have got a massive stride to make or else... Ben Johnson's leaving this season, and they are kind of, in a sense, not back to square one, but uh, call it for what you want, back to square two. I mean, cool. he, he, what's the chances they're going to replace a guy like Ben Johnson in one season? What's the chances that Jared Goff is going to redeem if if that he continues to play this way? I mean, there are so many questions at play right now at week two. And again, it is week two. Things are subject to change, but all this at right now needs to be discussed. Through week two, the Minnesota Vikings have the best point differential in the NFC North, and they just beat the 49ers with Sam Darnold. So, um, yeah, I think that's I think we all just got to stomach that a little bit when looking at the NFC North. I mean, it, like I said, it is week two. Um, but can I tell you what I'm overreacting to if I'm overreacting? Oh, uh, of course. The Pittsburgh Steelers are going to win the AFC North. Am I overreacting? You know, I'm going to say this, Hunter. I'm going to say this. I think at this point, I think, I think you're overreacting, but, but I completely see where you're coming from. And and with that said, not only is it very possible, it's, it's almost like I'm kind of like right now I'm in a place where look, I'm so close to buying it. Right. Like, like, like if we were, it's like, if you were trying to sell me something on the phone and I'm like, let me call you back in 30 minutes. Like, let me just yeah. discuss it with the, let me discuss it with the wife. Like, let, you know, like we're, we're really, I'm really close to buying it. I just got to think it over and, and have a little bit more time. Well, let me try but, to sell you. Yeah. Let I was saying, but I'm, I, I want to hear your points. Let, I, let I'm ready. Tell you. So right now the Steelers are top two in defensive EPA per play through two weeks. And there isn't another AFC North team in the top 10. They are one of three teams in the NFL with zero turnovers on offense. All other NFC North teams have two plus per game. And the Steelers have the best turnover differential in the NFL at plus five. No other AFC North team has a positive turnover differential. Only the Steelers and the Ravens are both top 15 offenses via PFF. Pittsburgh is graded the fourth highest passing offense in the AFC North. And Fields is a top five passing grade. Steelers are top seven in point differential. And the next highest 
is the AFC in the AFC North is 18th with Cincinnati. By far, the Steelers are playing the best football in the AFC North, and I don't even think it's a question. No, as of right now, 100% agree with that. I think here's what I'm going to say though, and and I, you you will agree with this. This is why this is why I need more time. This I, it's like I'm I'm going to say I'll call you back in a week because okay. this upcoming week is going to be a big test where, you know, again, not that the Chargers are, are world beaters at this point, but to our prediction preseason, Hunter, the Chargers are, are surprising a lot of people. They're a much better team than people thought. And more important than anything, they're a functioning, they have they have an identity. They have a functioning identity. They know exactly what they want to be, and they are what they want to be. So that's very important. We're, we're, that's a good, it'll be a good litmus test to see where the Steelers are at. And to the point of this, look, you know, I want to add before I go on to the other teams. If you're a Steelers fan, you have to be looking at the schedule right now. Uh, Doing a backflip. I mean, you're saying, okay, after this test, we get the Colts. And no disrespect to the Colts, but I'm sorry. The Steelers versus the Colts with with Malik Willis. With the defense, right, with the defense that the Steelers have, this should be, I mean, that should be a win right there. You know, you're looking and you're seeing, yeah, the Raiders is going to be a a tough game, but you know what? That's a very, very winnable game for the Steelers. The the Jets, albeit either the Jets, I I don't know how to feel about the Jets, Hunter. I I mean, I really don't. Are are the Jets a mid-team to everybody's surprise? Stay tuned to our power rankings this year, uh, this week on Friday. Yeah, power rankings on Friday. Don't don't miss it. (laughs) Uh, You got the Giants. You got the Giants after them. You got the Commanders after the Giants. You know, the Ravens don't look good. So you got the Ravens coming up. I mean... And again, all the, every divisional game, we know how divisional games go. Divisional games are bloodbaths, especially in the AFC North. But, you know, my, but the point is this, Hunter. Yeah, the back half of the schedule is tougher. But for what it's worth, if you can win a majority of your divisional games and you can win all those very winnable games you have on the rest of your schedule, yeah, it is possible. But then to the counterpoint of this, where because now I can already hear all the Browns, Ravens, and Bengals fans screaming in the comments, I want to leave it at this as well. You know, there is a point where we have to consider that – you know, the Bengals have had a much tougher stretch of first couple games. And, you know, the Ravens have had a much tougher stretch of first couple games. And and I don't even know how to feel about the Browns either. Like, at this point, the Browns, it's like, I, I don't even want to say they had a tougher stretch of games. Dude, they, they did. They definitely did. But at the same time, I, I really... I, I'm really close to Mark Cuban on the Browns where it's like, you know, I, I just don't know how they're going to win with Deshaun and, and this offensive line this year. I, I really don't, Hunter. So with all that said, I, I I am close to buying it, especially because, you know, I'm really glad that you made this one of your uh, reactions because I wanted to say this. And I was thinking about this literally. I, I don't know why I hopped out of the shower yesterday. This was what was going through my mind. You know, Steelers fans, I remember you guys on your rant for all these years about how Mike Tomlin needed to go, or at least, you know, some Steelers fans. I'm not going to say all Steelers fans, but you guys wanted to put it on Mike Tomlin. If Mike Tomlin wasn't coaching this team, this team would this team would have been in purgatory for a long time. Mike Tomlin is quite literally the the gorilla glue that holds this team together and it's so glaringly obvious because i don't want to add this 200 like like last thing and and i'll let you get back to it here but you know you we can we can say objectively look all those things about you said about Steelers offense are true but the bottom line is if the steelers defense wasn't the steelers the steelers defense they're owing to i mean that that's a fact right and the steelers are yes they they are the kings of complimentary ball where the defense is going to do 90 percent of the work and the offense is going to do 10 percent of what they got to do but and, and that, that all falls on mike tomlin and how he runs this team the scheme that he has in place every single year and more than anything the mindset that this team comes to play with they come to play violent they come to play downhill they come to keep things in front of them they are a just smart organized defense every single year and that is attributed to mike tomlin and like and yeah, the, the, again, like to close it out, the offense is playing good ball, but it's against the Falcons and the Broncos. At a point, we have to consider that we do need to see this offense against a better unit, and that's 100% a fact. But the bottom line that still stands, regardless of all that, is that Mike Tomlin is the glue. This defense is the glue. And if Mike Tomlin was not the coach of this team, not just this year, but all these previous years, the Steelers would have been picking top 10 for a long time here. And I think we can all agree on that at this point. I just think, yeah, I mean, I don't really have much more to contribute on top of that other than the fact of, like, would I put my money on the Steelers winning the AFC North? No. But with the way things have gone the last two weeks, if you here's my thing. In the offseason, if you would have told me, yo, the Steelers are going to win the AFC North, I'd be like, I'd put down the crack pipe, buddy. But if you told me it now, I would definitely be like, yeah, I can see it, dude. I mean, similar to the Patriots, like they're not going to win the, the AFC East, but it's like, yeah, they're not going to be one of the top three worst teams in the league. And I would have been like, 
would have been like, nah, I don't know, bro. But now, yeah, I get it. Like, and, and that's the unfortunate part is like, you really have to buy and sell like what teams are giving you and their off season moves, but no one truly knows until they get on the field. So, I mean, I, I don't think saying this is a complete overreaction, but I think until we see a team where they're going to have to get into like an offensive shootout, that is where I really think they're going to struggle. Like if they, if, if a team puts up 21 points on them, can they score 24? Can they score 22? Like that is my concern. But right now, the defense is playing score so, 20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if the defense is playing so lights out that it doesn't really matter, I mean, wins are hard to come by, and, like, everyone counts in the league. So that, that's kind of my last point on the Steelers. Very impressive with what they've been able to do. No, nonetheless, though, I want to just, you know, before we close out, absolutely very impressive. And uh, Mike Tomlin is the MVP of this team. We'll, yeah. You know, we'll leave it at that. Well, actually, that's not true. I, that TJ Watts the MVP of this team. But Mike Tomlin is right there with TJ. You know what I mean? All right, Dobbs, what are you overreacting to? Our last overreaction of the day. All right, Hunter, I don't think that I don't, I don't think I have to sell you on this one. But you know what? I might have to oh, sell some dude. Jaguars. I, just I might have to sell some Jaguars so fans, though. So sick. All right, go This ahead. one, oh man, this one. And this, and Jags fans, you know, prefacing, this one, this one hurt, hits me and Hunter a little personally. You know, if you were watching the show last year, you remember the Jags 1C narrative. You remember that we, first, we are the furthest thing from Jaguars haters. Let it be crystal clear on the table, right? This is, this comes from a place of love and a place of concern. But Hunter, my reaction that, that you have to tell me if I'm overreacting is, uh, have the Jaguars, A, completely lost direction, and B, are they going to ruin Trevor Lawrence? If they don't make the playoffs, Doug Peterson is gone. Oh, one but, does. But I do think there is a lot of issues. I, I wouldn't say it's the defense, though. You know? Like, it, I don't think it's necessarily a defensive issue with the Jaguars. But let me get Trevor Lawrence in his last seven starts. 0-7, 1,600 passing yards, 10 passing touchdowns, 7 interceptions, and 81.9 passer rating. Not very good. I've always been kind of a T-Law truther and uh, a Burrow truther. Burrow played all right. But I think, while I think there is questions on T-Law, I think we're going to start to see issues more issues with the offense and I I don't think Trevor Lawrence and Doug Peterson are really getting along and we kind of saw this with Peterson and Carson Wentz like Peterson won them a Super Bowl and then was out the year after so it's like I don't know what goes on there I don't necessarily know if they're ruining Trevor Lawrence I don't think Trevor Lawrence is playing his best ball but I don't think he's getting any favors from the coaching staff right now and it, it's, really, it's really starting to become really frustrating in the NFL now because it seems like incompetent coaching, and this has probably been the story as old as time, but it's, I don't know why it feels so apparent like these last couple years that the incompetent coaching staffs are just ruining these talents. Like ruining but some players. I want to throw a tangent in real quick. No, and I want to let you keep going because Go you're on fire no, right I now. Mean, that, I want to throw in a tangent because – I think that this is where it needs, you know, you're spot on at Hunter. This is where, this is what it can be attributed to. What it's attributed to is before uh, the social media craze and where we all could share our thoughts constantly and everybody had a sake every second. Right. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing where we can all share our thoughts at once and see collectively like, yeah, we know I'm not crazy. Everyone's seen the same thing as me. Like before it was only local stations, beat reporters, and then ESPN covering things, right? And, and, to, and, and ESPN can only cover some teams for so long. And ESPN is only going to cover the major markets for long periods of time because that's what brings them in the money. And, you know, here at YDKB, we're not worried about the money necessarily. We're worried about bringing you guys the truth constantly. We're going to cover every team for what it's worth for because we're going to cover what needs to be covered. And what needs to be covered right now is the fact that the Jaguars – are, in my opinion, Hunter, yeah, and I, I agree with what you're saying. Look, I don't necessarily, maybe ruining him is not the right word, but but they are completely hindering his development. I'm gonna, how about that? And, and I want to give you some of my points here that I have written down, you know, because I already, I know I already have you sold, but if there's any Jaguars fan that has any doubt in their mind or anybody else, let me just give you some points here that I think will sway how you view the situation. All right, number one, they blew a 10-point lead against the Dolphins in week one and then continued to not score after going up by 10. You know, and they also fumbled the ball to the back of the end zone with the chance to go up 17 makes it even worse. Yeah, that's not Trevor Lawrence's fault in the slightest. But 
speaks to the identity of this team right now. Uh, Jaguars have failed to score more than 17 points in the first two weeks. I mean, that is egregiously alarming when Doug Peterson is your coach and Trevor Lawrence is your quarterback. That's it's incredibly alarming. Jag, uh, Trevor Lawrence versus the Dolphins. 12 of 21, 162 yards, one touchdown, zero interceptions. I mean, that's really not it's just not impressive it's not i mean that's that's a you're you're throwing you're throwing under 50 percent. i mean and and you're not going you're not eclipsing 200 yards yeah you're keeping the turnovers down to to, to t loss credit no interceptions right first first couple weeks i mean that's that's cool and all but then you know again versus the browns this yesterday 14 of 30 220 yards zero touchdowns zero interceptions it's not moving the needle in the slightest but and this is where i want to really really hammer home the point this is not on Trevor Lawrence. At this point, Hunter, watching this scheme is like watching paint dry. The scheme is terrible. The offensive line is is abhorrent. That's the next thing I want to bring up, right? Let's let's talk about this. You know, via PFF, the highest graded O lineman for this team is Mitch Morse. You want to guess what his grade is, Hunter? Sixty-three. He's at a sixty-eight point oh, six. But you, so you, but, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're close. It's not good. And, and, <laughs> If that's the highest graded lineman on your team, your highest graded lineman is failing. He has an F. That's an F. He's not above 69. He's failing. Two linemen graded below 50, Hunter. 50 out of 100. Brendan Sheriff and Anton Harrison. And, you know, it's almost like... It's almost like we were swearing all off season that the direction that the Jaguars were going in terms of building the O-line was not only outdated, but just stupid. And you know what? I'm on my victory lap right now because we were so on the money about this. It's not funny. And and, and you know what? La- last thing here, because I'm, I'm ranting and I'm starting to get heated, but I'm heated for a purpose because this team had so much potential and they're yeah. squandering it. It's... You know, there was Jags fans all off season, Hunter swearing to me when, when we would go on and I would go on my tangents about the Jaguars direction team building you know people are swearing that Anton Harrison was not only the right pick but he had a good solid rookie year he did not have a solid rookie year he looked like a deer in the headlights a lot of the time he looked undersized a lot of the time which we already knew coming out of college and this year he looks atrocious I don't like to 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 rail on guys I don't but there's a point where you have to point out the weak link and right now Brandon Sheriff is a washed weak link Anton Harrison is not developing incredibly weak link and, and call it for what it is until that you fix the offensive play calling and until you fix the offensive line hunter this team is going absolutely nowhere they're going nowhere and and, and you know what last thing I said I said last thing twice <laughs> I promise I'm actually on the last thing now the direction that this team went in terms of building the receiver core i just don't understand in the slightest i love brian thomas jr we try to tell everyone it was going to take some time it will take time he will be a very productive receiver in time but it's not going to change anything this year gabe davis was not this not worth the money he would he was not in the slightest worth the money that he received and christian kirk Christian Kirk looks nothing like he did two years ago when he was first introduced to this offense christian kirk looks not existent at this point i'm gonna leave it at that and i'm I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave it at the on the defense the only two guys you have even playing anywhere near elite ball, Devin Lloyd, Josh Allen, everyone else needs to step up. And yet the point you're looking at points and you're saying, oh, well, it's not that bad. But you know what? They didn't play two good offenses. The offense that they played at this point. Yeah. And, you know, the Dolphins offense should be good, but they haven't played good this year. So the bottom line is that, yeah, they're not playing good on either side of the ball. Major changes need to be made, Hunter. Major changes because this team has way too much potential to be playing like this. That I think is the most frustrating thing and I'm not going to say too much, but that has been my most frustrating situation with or frustrating issue with the Jacksonville Jaguars is they're just one of those teams that has the talent, but just can't put it together. Like it feels like when they played the chargers and they came back, right? It felt like they really had something. And then it felt like they couldn't get over the hump the next year. And then, it feels like I've been watching the same Jaguars team for years. It doesn't feel like anything's changed. Like, players may have gotten better, but, like, the culture of, like, getting it done has not changed. And maybe that's a Doug Peterson thing. I don't know. But I just know that, like, when you pay a quarterback $50, $60 million, usually between the quarterback and the coach, the coach is the one that goes. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a new coach Maybe Nick Saban? No, I'm just kidding. Because they want Urban Meyer. But 
I do think we're going to see a change for the Jaguars this year if they don't make the playoffs. And unfortunately, that's the reality um, for the Jaguars this year. I mean, when you're in a division like the AFC South where you have the Texans who are, I mean, the way Stroud is playing, they will be winning that division almost every year. I mean, the Jags are 0-2, the Colts are 0-2, the Titans are 0-2. Like, it's the Texans division, so you're going to have to have a good enough record to be a wild card team. And it just seems like they can't get it done in big moments, and that's what you kind of need half the time to be a wild card team, right? Like, you need to be kind of a scrappy team, and the Jags, to me, are not. They don't seem like they're, like, this ultra-physical, like, run-down-your-throat, like, team. So... Unfortunately, oh, for the maybe Jack. furthest thing from it, Hunter. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's just it's tough, like, man. I don't know. It's, it's and I want to add this to you. It's very. I want to add this because th- this is where this is where it gets even. Uh, this is where it gets really scary too. Is we already talked about the first two weeks. Let's let's just go. Let's take a peek into the crystal ball for a second. You have the Bills next week, and then you have the Texans the week after. You have the Colts after that. Where you know what? I, I mean, yeah, the Colts don't look good, but that's a game where the Colts can win that game. There's actually a very realistic chance that the Jaguars are going to start the season 0 and 5. Sound all the alarms. Sound every single alarm. And then after that, you have to face the vaunted Bears defense. And yeah, we know about the Bears offense. Well, the matchup of, but you know what? As of right now, play that game tomorrow. I'm taking the Bears defense over what the Jaguars are doing. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I'm being 100% objective. It, it, and then the rest of the year, you have the Eagles on there. You have the Vikings. You have the Lions. Texans twice, as we know. You got the Jets later. I mean, Hunter, this is this is not only an uphill battle. It it just to me almost looks unrealistic that the Jaguars make the playoffs at this point. I hope they prove me wrong because, as you know, residential Jaguars truthers here. We want we don't want it to be this way. This comes from a place of passion. This comes from a place of knowing that this team could be so much more. Yo, hold on. We have to address this, and we can do it right now. The Panthers are benching Bryce Young and starting Andy Dalton this week. Yo. Canales has benched Bryce Young. Let's talk about this really quick, Dobbs. Let's let's get this out of the way. Is this the worst decision in football? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, Hunter. I think that um it's how about this? It's not it's the most unfortunate, it's the most unfortunate situation in football. But here's the reality. I think if anything, you're trying to salvage and any chance you have of turning him into something, but let's call it for what it is. I mean, this and any again. From the first two weeks of all 22, Bryce Young does look like the worst quarterback in football. He has, again, we, back to last week. Right now, there's zero rhythm, zero rhythm. There's zero timing. There is zero pocket presence. And yes, their pocket, it, it, their whole line isn't playing like good football, but they're actually playing it's better football bad. than a lot it's of these other bad. bad yeah, like they're playing better at football than a lot of these other bad lines. They just poured over $100 million into the O-line this offseason. You know, I think it hits a point where you're saying to yourself, if we're going to suck, Let's at least let's at least give a guy a shot that's at least going to give us a chance to win a couple games here and, and give our team some like everyone else that we just signed somewhat of faith in the future of this team. Because I'm going to be honest, Hunter, I think the reality is if you're especially Dave Canals at this point, you're saying to the ownership and you're saying to yourself, look, not only to save my job, but just the future of this team. We are very likely going to be picking a quarterback again. It does not matter. This basically kind of looks like a Josh Rosen 2.0 situation. Yes, I'm aware that Josh Rosen was bailed on the immediate year afterwards. I know that Bryce has had two years, but basically at this point, it looks like he's had one year. You get what I'm saying here? So this is basically just a Josh Rosen 2.0 to me where where Canales is saying, look, he's not my guy. He's not the guy, and this is not going to work. We 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 ship him somewhere this offseason. We go another direction this off this offseason, and I think that that's the only thing you can say and every Panthers fan at this point I think would agree with that too I don't know one Panthers fan that's still in on Bryce Young unfortunate as it is Hunter he was thrown into the worst situation imaginable and it has completely broken him mentally and it's it's getting close to breaking him physically because the amount of hits that he forces himself into and that he takes from from O-line play when the O-line isn't playing good it's just every combination that you could throw in to a pot and mix it's the worst ingredients you could have had I guess my thing is though like there's no way you put him back in it this year, right? Like, no, that's no. I, I at this point, I mean, like, so what do you trade him? I, I, but that's the thing. Who trade him to who? And and, and that's kind of where I think the, the Raiders. Is, I don't know. Like, there's teams that need a quarterback. 
Well, I guess, yeah, you know what? There are, and, and there are teams with... with... The Giants? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, dude. Like, I just, I'm going to say, like, and again, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I think that we can agree on this. Hunter, if, if I was, if I had the keys to an NFL team right now, I, I'm not giving up draft capital, maybe minus a, a seventh, a sixth for Bryce Young, because... Yeah. Because you know my feeling about it's a draft capital league. I, you know, a lot of people love to disregard, oh, it's a sixth, it's a seventh. There are all pros and pro bowls picked every year in the sixth and seventh round. You know, yeah. it's about hitting on the right guy, right? I mean, I don't want to, I just think that it's almost to the point where Bryce, his, the, the value that he's lost from years one to, to two, it, it might be the biggest in history. I have a master plan ready to go right now. Okay. I love it. I'm, 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 you know, I'm all used to the master plan. Bear with me. Okay. I'm going to walk you through this. Pick up the phone. Okay. Like, I'm all right. I, I'm ready. You're Dan, you're Dan Morgan trying to deal Bryce Young. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, hi, this is the, Ant, the Atlanta Falcons. Um, what are you looking for for Bryce Young? We, we want to kind of a succession plan to Penix. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, at this point, I'm going to need, yeah, because he's young, he still has he still has he still has a chance. Well, that that's perfect for us because Penix is old, so we could just sit him behind Penix and let him develop while Penix plays after Kirk Cousins plays. Okay, I, no, you know, I hear where you're coming from. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say I'm gonna need at this point. I'm gonna need I'm gonna need a, I'm gonna need a fifth from you guys because okay, I don't want to look back on this where if he ends up developing and and right now it's terrible. But I'm gonna need at least a fifth from you guys right now. Okay, hold on. Uh, this is Terry Fondo, but I'm going to put Ryan Pace on the phone real quick to do the deal. Yeah, I'll give you two first. That's how the deal would go. That's how Ryan Pace would handle it. But no, it, it, that's a joke, obviously, but it's like... Dude, this that was, is this That is was insane. classic. You set me up. <laughs> this, Yeah, it, this is insane, dude. Like, I, okay, I, I don't know. Like, do we just... Uh, I need to look more into this stuff, but I just feel like we had to talk about it since it was since it happened live. Oh no, I, we we need to turn that we need to turn that into a whole separate video. I mean, that's that that that's, that's real live reaction. And I I think look, uh, you know, because it's completely shifted gears. But look, Panthers He's, fans, let's just let's just address the situation for what it is. Um, I think, and th th this is really really where it starts, Hunter. And this, and, and, and there, I don't think there's any Panthers fan on earth that's going to disagree at this point. And we we we've been echoing the sentiment for a whole 365 days plus at this point. David Tepper has not only shown to be an inept owner, but he's shown to be a relatively um. I'm I'm sorry. I don't like again. I don't like to rail on people, but he's he's kind of shown to be a uh, a jackass, right? Call it for what it is. He, he he's shown to be a jackass, and and he has no clue what he's doing in terms of football operations. I think not only do does this team have major roster issues and quarterback issues, they genuinely it, 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 it all starts from the top hunter. It's actually very similar to what the, what the commanders were just going through until that the until that the uh, well is cleaned from the top down. I don't know if the Panthers are going to see any type of success and it doesn't really matter what happens. Andy Dalton could take 400 cycles of steroids and it's not going to change anything about the Panthers. I, I, I mean, to, jokes aside, Panthers fans, I'm sorry. I, I really, from a Saints fan, I am sorry for what you guys are going through. This, this is about as low as it gets. I mean, this in our lifetime, Hunter, I don't know if we've seen anything like this. I did. This is like, this is, it, it is truly, and, I, and we use this word a lot, but this time I really can't emphasize enough. This is truly unbelievable. I, I'm i reading the Panthers subreddit right now, and it's just, man, I, I can't remember anything like this, like this big of a draft trade. I was literally talking. I was joking with my friends last night. I was like, who's a bigger bust, Bryce Young or Jamarcus Russell? And they're like, Jamarcus Russell, dude. But I'm like, with what they gave up for him, you know, like, ah, dude. This this might this is might be one of the worst trades of all time, worst picks of all time. Just well, again, who's a again, who, Hunter? Who does it fall on? I mean, who who does, it all falls on Tepper. It, it does. It, it is. Tepper. It all it all starts at the top. These were all decisions green light, green lit, and and wanted by him. So, well, thank. All right, next week on overreactions, should the Carolina Panthers bench Andy Dalton for Bryce Young? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Next week, do, do the Panthers D relegate themselves and come back next year? Do the Panthers D relegate themselves to the to the USFL or wherever else? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, the Panthers are going to come down, and uh, Ohio State's going to come up to the NFL, and that's what we're going to do.
But thank you guys so much for watching. This has been Overreacting to Week 2 of the NFL. If you don't know ball, want to know ball, be sure to subscribe. Leave a like. Let us know in the comments your biggest overreaction from Week 2. We will have new videos almost every day. The only video we don't post, or only day we don't post is Sunday because we're enjoying football. But um, we're hope we hope you guys have been enjoying the new type of content. Uh, we've been really trying to put some more into it, so we're very excited to keep creating content for you guys. Have a great rest of your day, and uh, enjoy Philly-Atlanta tonight. Ew, what a ew game.